this is a novel that I've been working on for a really long time, and the main reason I've been working on it for a long time is I'm not plot, I don't write plot-driven stuff. Um, and um, it takes place in June 1988 in East Berlin. So how many of you were not around in 1988? Okay, so just in case there's some people who aren't around, some people who may have been around and weren't like really aware of world events, but um, in November 1989, the wall came down between East and West. But this is June 1988, before people had an idea that might happen. Um, so that's in the background. I think the novel, the novels had many titles. Um, right now it's called What You Must Know or it might be called Notes for Performance. Yeah. And uh, I just need this, I'm reading you the beginning, but uh, sometimes it's hard to, um, I don't know, to understand a word if, if I'm reading it, where you would understand it if you wrote it, if you read it. So uh, the main character's name is Mandy. Her father calls her Mandela. Uh, she talks about Simone Weil, W-E-I-L, who she tells you about. And I also talk about, I use the term fantasy ecla, which is end of a century. Okay. And every little portion is numbered. One, I am a failure. Two, I collect dead people who knew that they had failed. <laughs> Three, whose fame is posthumous. I dive into their biographies and make performances. I become them. I am reviewed, interviewed. It is not enough. Four, oh, to be a sculptor like Henry Moore, your life full of years and decades of work, working through your 80s, feeling the force in you to move forward, pulled into the future like metal following a magnet, so sure that you do not hesitate essentially, to write in stone. Five, I hate my naked need, my impulse to bring up in conversation my performances, my good reviews, to prove, always to prove that I belong here on earth. Oh, the frustration to know that you're trying too hard, saying too much, and to be unable, powerless it seems, to stop yourself. This is an ambition, the way poet Donald Hall uses it, the thirst to be as good as Dante. The pure, holy variety of ambition has to do with art, with honing and polishing. This is naked ambition, close to cravenness, and it smells like the sweat that comes with fear. Six, my brother Andy based his life, our life, on other people's, a way out of the thicket. We were Andy and Mandy in Texas, but in his mind, we were also Andre and Simone Bay of Paris, children of an earlier generation. Andre the math genius, she the rail thin galant who built philosophies that serious people keep quoting. There was talk of sainthood for her and Edith Stein, too. The Catholics put former Jews on the fast track to beatification as examples to the rest of us. They assume one day we'll see the Old Testament as only half full, and we'll embrace their miracles. <laughs> the virgin who came, gave birth to the Messiah, the very dead man who flew out of a cave, the divinity of the Pope. Divinity, my brother would say, is the pontiff selling candy now to supplement his treasure rooms? Kind of candy. Uh, should have explained that. My father admired the Catholics for continuing the art of alchemy with their blood and body. He was an amateur magician and it was a professional assessment. They're hypnotizers too, Mandela, he would say joyfully, delighted at the notion as if it were new each time. They get everyone to believe in that story and they believe that their lord makes a return round trip whenever one of them bites into that stale piece of matzah. Seven, a Yiddish statement of incredulity. Nishkestoige, nishkefloigen. It didn't climb, it didn't fly. 
referring to Christ. Eight, the ones who gazed on the crucifixion because they found nothing in Judaism to contain the sorrow they knew. Simone Weil, Alfred Doblin, the writer. Only the crucifix was small enough and large enough to contain all despair. And yet the joy that believers find, that all is unfolding according to plan. Nine, the people who imagine they are Jesus, is it so they can hear God whispering? 10. As Chuck drove me to the airport, we were listening to Christian radio for narrative. The radio preacher said, Lord Jesus was not born in a manger. He was born during before time, living in limbo, before he and God and spirit created time and space. Jesus is timeless, more ancient than Abraham, than Adam and Eve, he said. Chuck said, only in the Bay Area would you have an evangelist who talks like a Zen mystic. The preacher said, Jesus is a, photo is a photograph of the invisible God. The Protestants, too, looking to one-up the Jews to prove we got here first. Eleven, oh, I miss my brother Andy, who was to have been your uncle, or should I say, who would have been your uncle-to-be? Who am I talking to? I, who have marched and leafleted for a woman's right to choose, how can I be talking to a barely conceived little tadpole? Oh, my dear little zygote, I know you're there. <laughs> Although it's too early to prove it with a pregnancy test, I feel the, hes the heaviness and an almost movement that Carlos's little swimmers did make it to the shore. I know you're too small to be sentient. You're like a blood clot. What's that religion that believes that souls are waiting in a giant green room to come into the world and attach themselves to a new being? I imagine that and your spirit, all air and wanting, impatient to become flesh. Yes, that's who I'm explaining everything to, the one who is not yet here but will be, the future, the new life that is outwitting Carlos, who I, who I will explain later. Twelve, but first the failure at hand. My first time in Germany, and last night I performed The Repair Shop of the World, my most accessible show, the one on my grant application. I didn't realize here is not there. When I get on stage and say that Germans were victims of Hitler, when I criticize Holocaust survivors for accepting reparations, American audiences know that I'm being sarcastic. Saturday, Saturday night, the Germans didn't. They didn't laugh, where everyone usually laughs. And it wasn't a language problem. They all knew English, and there were German surtitles. <laughs> no laughing, then guffaws. I never had guffaws before. I was a Jew on stage in allegedly enlightened West Berlin, sympathizing with Germans during the Reich and criticizing Jewish survivors. But I was joking. <laughs> Afterward, everyone said how it was great, etc., etc. And when I told Marta that the audience thought I was serious, she said, no, no. But I could tell she wasn't sure. Charlotte said, don't be ridiculous. Marta told me later that Germans, meaning non-Jews, tell Auschwitz jokes, punchlines about Jews and ashes and crematoria. They are resentful of the Jews for taking reparations. If only she told me before, before I left home a month ago, which was before I met her. 13. Years ago, Beata told me that instead of booing, German soccer fans will yell at a player who makes a bad play. Yuda, Yuda. 14. I had the good sense not to perform Sarah B, La Grande Horizontale, which moves from Sarah Bernhardt to the Jewish American princess and back part of my series on Jewish nobility. Sarah Bernhardt conformed to the 19th century stereotype of the Jewish seductress. The stereotype now is the Jap, the Jewish American princess who hates sex. That has to be for class reasons. As more Jews become upper middle class, the Jap has turned into the wasp. 15, I thought of performing a portion of Salome, the Jewish non-American princess, my work in progress based on Oscar Wilde's Salome, a tragedy. 
Sarah Bernhardt had planned to produce Oscar Wilde's play, which he wrote in French, but it never worked out. I read the play in an art history class on fantasy Eccle Europe. The play begins with Salome looking at the moon. She has walked out of the banquet that her stepfather Herod is hosting. He is the king of Judea. She hates this uncle who married her widowed mother. Hamlet, anyone? She can hear muffled shouts and she learns they are the curses of John the Baptist, prisoner of the kingdom, who is held in a cistern. She orders that he be brought out. She asks him for a kiss. He refuses and denounces her, curses her and her mother. From inside, Harry calls for Salome. He's drunk. Please dance for us, he says. He is a stepfather who cannot keep his eyes off his stepdaughter. He will give her half his kingdom if she will dance for him. He offers Salome his peacocks, his beautiful, tame, white peacocks with gold beaks and purple legs. He has hundreds of peacocks. He's willing to part with 50. No dice. No, 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 no. Hera tries to coax her. He will give her anything. Anything. She refuses and refuses and then complies. She will dance for him if in return he will give her the head of John the Baptist. Only this will do. Blood is already on the stage floor, slippery after a young soldier killed himself with dispatch and his sword because Salome did not return his affections. That was earlier this evening. It is time for more blood. Herod agrees to her demand. She dances her famous dance of the seven fails. John is beheaded, his head delivered on the proverbial platter, which Salome takes and holds aloft in her palm. She puckers and touches him lip to lip, speaking to the severed head. J'ai baisé ta bouche, Yocanan. No wonder Oscar Wilde wrote in French the play was so scandalous. I kissed your mouth, she is saying. Herod then orders her killed. It is obscene to kiss a beheaded prisoner it is permitted to lust after your wife's daughter, if you are the man in charge. A vildahaya, a wild animal, used to designate a problem child, a wild girl. Salome is Hamlet. She is Ophelia, who will not go quietly. Her problem, says one famous Jewish-American scholar, is the same that all the 19th century Jewish girl hysterics had, her stepfather's lasciviousness. She is haunted by memories. Now we would call it abuse. Scratch a Jewish princess and you will find Freud with his notepad, who has already claimed the territory. 16, that is Wilde's play, not mine. Mine isn't finished. I don't know exactly how much to explain about Salome. After one workshop performance in Berkeley, a girl I'd waited on fairly often in the bakery complained that she didn't get all of it. She was the kind of customer who always asked for samples of soup, but never bought any. She said during the audience discussion, you can't presume that people know who Salome is. I went to the University of Chicago, and if the story was common knowledge, I would have learned about it there. She came to my stage readings just because they were free, never the performances that cost all of $15, or even the ones with a sliding scale. My U of C, she would say, to differentiate it from UC Berkeley, She's never learned that everyone in the Bay Area refers to UCB as Cal. Yes. Whereas all the alumni of Harvard I've ever met display modesty about their college and university, even if it's false. They'll say, I went to school in Boston, <laughs> or near Boston. Only the boldest will admit, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. 